guys, Jim Hoffman here for EMS Office Hours, and this is your Monday Minutes. Okay, today, guys, I'm sure you're looking at the first slide here, and you're seeing hemorrhage, right? Now, a lot of us might think that we've got hemorrhaging under control. We know what it's all about. It's a basic skill, right, in EMS. We get people that, that bleed all the time from various parts of their body. But I think what I'm trying to do, guys, with these Monday Minutes is, of course, if you've been watching, listening to any of the previous episodes, is to give you little snippets of these sections of EMS that can help you not just in your patient care and even your documentation of patient care, but also when you're taking exams and when you're trying to express what's going on with the patient. So by breaking it down a little bit, I think if you, uh, you know, try to take away something from these short Monday Minutes, is to go ahead and take away these little sort of snippets of a broader, uh, you know, uh, topic. Okay, so we talk about hemorrhage. You talk about you can talk about things like shock when it goes on, everything that goes along with that, right? Medications that can that can affect it, um, a patient's medical history, all that. But today, I'm just going to talk a little about what hemorrhaging is. And you know, when we think about a patient that's bleeding. This is the blood vessel that's gotten dis disrupted, right? Now you've got an open circuit that usually you have a closed circuit, the human body, right? It's a closed circulatory system. So that blood that's supposed to be contained is all of a sudden it's, it's, it's getting released. It's, it's getting allowed out from that injury, okay? And the injury, keep in mind, too, can be internal, that internal bleeding, or it can be out of the body, right, the external bleeding. So the significance of a patient's injury can be dependent on the blood vessel type and the blood vessel size. And when we talk about that, we're talking about things like capillary, venous, or arterial. Now arteries are those, you know, they're thicker walled, they're muscular vessels, and they transport blood to the tissues. And the pulse that gets palpated in these blood vessels, in the arterial blood vessels, reflect a combination of the force of the heart's contraction and the contraction or the vasodilation of the blood vessels themselves. So when we demonstrate something, you know, I'm going to try to show you a picture here. Uh, you know, you can see the arterial bleed is going to have a pulsatile flow. It's going to be much brighter red in color, and this is because of that increased oxygen content in, in an arterial bleed. And arteries also have a higher uh, intravascular pressure, okay, so they require um, a, lot more pre a lot more pressure for you to stop the bleeding, okay. Um, and just as a note, aorta, it's the largest artery in the body, and you've also got the femoral artery, the carotid, and the brachial arteries as well, which are the largest vessels, the largest arteries that are outside the thoracic abdominal uh, cavity. Now, we talk about veins, they're more pliant, they're not as muscular, and they transport blood back and forth from um, the body to the heart. Now, the amount of blood in any vein ends up being uh, dependent on the diameter of that vein, okay? But the vein is a low pressure system, and it becomes easier for us as providers and, and for, you know, in the field to stop the bleeding with direct pressure. Now, capillaries... This is sort of that in-between, right, between the arterial and the venous system. The capillaries transport blood to organs for uh, cellular transfer of oxygen and, and other, uh, you know, materials that, that organs and the body needs to, to, to survive. And the body's autonomic system uh, selectively controls that flow to certain beds of the capillaries, um, especially when we talk about uh, in times of stress, to sort of shut off those less essential areas. You've heard of shunting, right, where the body shunts blood from one area to another, uh, you know, in times of stress. And when you see bleeding from capillaries, guys, it's going to be more of an ooze, right? It's not going to be a pulsating type flow. It's not going to be a steady type flow. Um, it's going to be more of an ooze, and it's going to be pretty easily stopped when we do direct pressure um, uh, on a capillary type bleed. Now, when we talk about stopping bleeding, Okay, we're talking about coagulation, all right, and getting those those vessels to coagulate. 
And the system, the coagulation system in, in the body, it's, it's really designed to kind of come into play uh, when that blood vessel's lining um, ends up being disrupted, like we mentioned, right? It gets cut, right? And now it's, it's coming out, either out of the body or inside the body. So the platelets that are floating in the blood start to stick to the open surface and clump together, right? You get that coagulation. They start clumping together to seal that hole in the vessel where the blood is escaping from. So the platelet plug that starts getting developed you know, turn, you know, starts to stimulate that clotting and creates, you know, the buildup and buildup, okay, where you get that fiber sort of gets, um, starts to get uh, developing and creates that permanent seal, right, permanently starts to close off that vessel. So when we hold pl pressure on a wound, no matter what it is, capillary, venous, or arterial, okay, this allows the body's natural uh, clotting mechanisms to start taking hold. But what happens is, you know, you ever see when they tell you don't release it, right? Don't take off the direct pressure because when you do that, if you release that direct pressure too soon, then the the, the proteins and all that that we're talking about it goes on at that time don't have enough for, don't have enough time to form up as we mentioned, uh, you know, kind of being able to seal that hole. Don't have enough time to form up. And then the process of the coagulation ends up getting interrupted. So when we talk about controlling the, the bleeding or the hemorrhage, you have the internal hemorrhage. And guys, listen, for us as pre-hospital providers, um, you know, we can recognize it. We can transport those patients. But it's hard for us to manage uh, internal bleeding on patients, right? Fluid resuscitation, we're going to do things like that. Um, but a lot of patients, they end up having to have transfusions or even operative type treatment in order to stop bleeding. But for us as pre-hospital care providers, the external hemorrhage is the one where we actually come into play to try to control it. Now, I'm not going to go into all the different ways as far as uh, using things like quick clots or tourniquets or, uh, you know, hemostatic type devices. Um, what I want to talk primarily about today is using direct pressure, using compression. So... When we talk about direct pressure that gets applied to a patient's site that's bleeding, it really is the most important thing we can do to control that external bleeding. So the ability to control that bleeding it, it depends upon the source that we mentioned earlier. Is it arterial? Is it venous? Is it capillary? You know, it's going to depend upon where it's coming from, how easy or difficult it's going to be to manage it. And the, the size of the, uh, the, the defect in, in the vessel and the pressure in the vessel. So a bigger vein, vein is going to be harder to control than a smaller vein, right? So think about it like a pipe, right? you got a pipe, there's water going through it. You know, that vessel with a larger diameter and more pressure is going to be much more rapidly flowing the blood. So it's going to be harder to control, right? So compression works to control that hemorrhage slows the flow of blood from that, that, that cut or that wound, and the body's, proce the body's process, natural process of clotting can start to work, okay? So a lot of times compression, they tell you what, gloved hand and replace it with gauze, right? And always maintain that pressure until the bleeding gets under control. So dressings, like we mentioned, they shouldn't be replaced once they become soaked, right? Because that can actually disrupt that clotting. Because the clot might have formed, let's say, on the skin, the surface of the skin. You take off that, that gauze and you open it up again. So instead of, don't replace it, don't move it. It might look messy, right? But instead, just put on more dressings on top of the other dressings, okay? And you might have to do more and more depending upon how much blood loss you have. So now, if this doesn't control the hemorrhage, then you got to do what? It's the pressure dressing, right? And the pressure dressing is more bulky dressing wrapped tightly with roller gauze. That's your best bet, right? Put nice heavy dressings on top of what you've already got going on and use the go roller gauze uh, you know, to be applied to get it more effective. So something to think about, guys. You know, And again, that's going to depend your success on controlling the bleeding with direct pressure and using pressure dressings is going to depend upon where the blood's coming from, size of the vessel, is it a venous, is it arterial, and whether or not you're going to be successful or not. Now, of course, if you're not, you've got other things to think about. Again, 
hemostatic type devices or dressings, tourniquets, uh, the quick clots that might be getting used. I'm not going to go into that, guys. It would be too much for me to go into on a quick Monday Minutes here. But I do want to mention some special things you should look for uh, when it comes to bleeding on patients. Things like a foreign body or impaled objects that might be inside of a wound or from a, a fracture. So if you've got a wound, you've got a patient bleeding from you know an impaled object, you can try to go ahead and do direct pressure, but apply it around the object to help control the bleeding. Don't pull the object out. Of course, follow your local protocol, but most protocols are going to tell you not to remove the impaled object. If you do that and out of the hospital, right, you're doing it out in the field, okay, the problem is that that impaled object might actually be acting as a tamponade type device that's helping to control the bleeding. If you pull it out, you might end up making the hemorrhage worse, okay? So keep that in mind. This is why they don't want you to take it out. Not because it doesn't look good or because it looks dramatic, right? They don't want you to take it out because it can cause more damage by taking it out in the field. You don't have the, the, the means necessary to stop a more severe bleed. In addition, you talk about things like fractures, especially like big bones, like pelvis fractures, femur fractures. You might also have a lot of things going on when it comes to internal hemorrhage, so keep that in mind, okay? I'm sure you've heard pelvic fractures can get almost three liters of blood in the pelvis, especially with those unstable type fractures, okay? So just things to keep in mind, guys. And with femur fractures, you should try to give that traction, right? Apply traction to, to that, that fracture, okay? And this is going to help to prevent broken bone fragments from, you know, cutting other blood vessels that might be going on internally and damage other blood vessels and other, other tissues. Okay, guys, that's it. I don't want to go any further than that, but I hope just some quick considerations to consider um, common ways to stop this type of, of bleeding. But I think the, the bigger takeaway, I think, in today's Monday Minutes, guys, is to just recognize the different, level, the different levels of bleeding, whether it's venous, uh, capillary, or, or, or arterial, and to understand that the, it's, it's, also, it's not so much the type of vessel it comes from. It also has to do with the strength of the contractions, the diameter of the vessels, and how that's going to affect when you're trying to control the bleeding and to keep all that in the front of your mind when you get patients that have um, you know bleeding going on. Okay, so you can kind of recognize it and then to help you express what you found to the emergency department uh, when you get there so that they, they can go ahead and act appropriately when you tell them that you think it's an arterial bleed because it's pulsating, it's bright red, and how much blood might have been lost versus a capillary that's not ble not actively bleeding, it's sort of oozing out and it's controlled easily, right? Great ways to you know express the ER what's going on and great ways when you're documenting your patient care Okay, so you're documenting it correctly and you're documenting it appropriately in a medical sort of point of view. Guys, I hope you can use these Monday Minutes. Um, I know pretty basic this week, right? But again, hopefully you can take away some little nuggets of what I talked about today to help you with your documentation, patient care, and even when you're taking your next, next EMS exam. Guys, send me some information, some suggestions on minutes of your own. Love to go ahead and include them on upcoming Monday Minutes. Uh, be sure to comment below in the show notes. Let me know what you think about today's episode. And as always, I'll see you next week. Until then, stay safe.